All right. Well, we're going to get started uh, on time for today, uh, being the 20th of January. So welcome everyone to the first Virginia Main Street webinar of 2022. I guess really the first, uh, the first half or second half of the first. So uh, I'm Kyle Meyer, Community Development Administrator of DHCD's Virginia Main Street Program, and I'm going to be your moderator today. So as usual, a little housekeeping. To reduce background noise and distraction, please mute yourself and turn off your camera. That provides a sharper focus to our speakers. Uh, to our speakers. So look for that little microphone and camera at the bottom center of the browser window. Uh, we're recording this webinar, as you might uh, be able to tell. And so shortly afterwards, uh, we will post the recording and the presentation handout on virginiamainstreet.com. Uh, there will be a Q&A period at the end, uh, so please use that chat feature to ask questions. I believe that our speaker will also be uh, reaching out to you after each segment uh, of his of his presentation. So use the chat feature to answer some of those questions as well. But anytime along the way, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and pop them in. And, and uh, when the time is right, uh, I as moderator will make sure that I integrate that into the conversation. So um, I'm gonna move past that for this time. But um, I want to point out that our Community Revitaliz Revitalization Office 2022 calendar of events uh, is now posted on virginiamainstreet.com in addition to the um, Virginia Main Street program page on the agency website, dhcd.virginia.gov. So there's a couple places that you can find it, but I want to give you a few highlights uh, moving uh, just over the next few months, something to be aware of. So we have a number of uh, how to applies that are coming up, as well as a really great webinar hosted by our program manager, Christina Kane of the newly uh, created Virginia Small Business Resiliency Fund. Uh, so on the 17th, we have a microfinancing webinar on entrepreneurial ecosystems. So that's open to uh, our entire network, uh, to anybody that would find value in that. So look out for registration and information about that soon. Uh, we'll also have a how to apply for the downtown investment grant for our Virginia advancing Virginia Main Street communities, uh, as well as we will cover the community vitality grant that's available to exploring Main Street communities and the financial feasibility grant that's available to both, though it's staggered. And then we'll talk about more about that access to that uh, on that day. So that's the 22nd of February. On the 24th, we'll have a uh, how to apply for the community business launch for the fiscal uh, fiscal year 23, which is just amazing. Both the BMS and the CBL grants close on April 28th, so you have a little bit more time uh, in, in this new cycle than before, so just keep that in mind, April 20th, 28th, very important date. Um, and we're continuing tradition, so Chris's team will lead the microfinance uh, regional rev up workshop. Um, so more information will come out about that, but this is really an opportunity to focus in on getting capital into your entrepreneurial ecosystem. So that's getting uh, the funds or access to the funds uh, for your uh, growing uh, existing small businesses. Um, so uh, look out for that. And let's see. And then on April 4th, we'll host the Industrial Revitalization Fund How to Apply webinar. But this is a big deal. We're gearing up for the National Main Street Conference, which is co-hosted by us here in Richmond, Virginia, May 16th through 18th. So registration is going to be open later this month. So will announcements about volunteer opportunities. Um, so we've got 70 slots to fill for the volunteer opportunity. So we welcome your assistance and your participation. Along with that, you get a pretty significant discount uh, for registration. So keep that. Uh, in mind, more information will come on both of those. So with that, let's get to the, get to the heart of our webinar today. Uh, and we are going to learn a little bit about uh, those essential community leadership skills to really start the year off on a strong foot. And that's framing ideas, building relationships, and mobilizing resources. Um, uh, we'll also reveal a bit about uh, the uh, an opportunity to advance those skills. Um, so, so listen up. Stick around all the way to the end. Our speaker is Chris Atkins. 
He's the program director of the newly created Virginia Rural Leadership Institute housed in the Virginia Rural Center. Uh, that is all located here in our uh, in the same building as DHCD, which is exciting. I'm glad to have uh, uh, now connected with some new colleagues, though they've always been around. I'm so glad we finally crossed paths. Chris collaborates with partners on all levels to lead a program that seeks to find and grow uh, rural leaders while empowering them to become highly valuable citizens in their community. Chris grew up in uh, Clark County in the Berryville area, so that makes him a neighbor of Winchester, so Winchester being a designated community. Uh, he's a Virginia Tech uh, alumnus, and he is also a graduate of the UVA's uh, Sorensen Institute for Political Leadership, so welcome, Chris. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, and Chris, the stage is all yours. Use, yours. Uh, let's see. So uh, let me go ahead and stop and uh, hand over the reins. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> As, go. you know, Kyle said, we're going to talk about three very important issues uh, to communities. And, and starting off the beginning of the year, we think it's really important. Um, so we'll, we'll jump right into it. Uh, Kyle also gave a little bit about myself. Obviously, you know, I'm Chris Atkins, born and raised in Clark County, Virginia, where we have more cows uh, than people and more apple trees than cows. Uh, since then, I moved down to the Chesterfield area and do work in um, the Richmond area. But I think it's really important to talk about a few things. My background um, through academics is I have a degree in agricultural leadership and community development, and I've taken that to my professional career where I now own a small business that's focused on rural clients and rural issues. Um, my entire passion is, is helping rural communities, rural businesses, and rural organizations find the success that they need. And that's how we came up with the Virginia Rural Leadership Institute, which we'll talk about at the end of this presentation. So today we're going to talk about three major things, and then uh, at the very end we'll talk about the Rural Leadership Institute. But we're going to talk about practical skills for framing ideas and issues. Uh, also, how to build relationships in your community. That may seem like a very simple thing to do, but there are a lot of basics that we can be doing to, to help build those relationships and find the success in our communities. We're also gonna talk about mobilizing our resources and what that looks like, and not just financial, financial resources, but the other resources that our communities have. So first we'll get started talking about practical skills for, for framing issues. Um, you know, all of us need public support in our, in our communities. And there's two things that we need to do to get that public support. Uh, public support is not just uh, people understanding your issue or uh, even people being willing to show up to a meeting. Um, when you know you really need to uh, reach public support, you need to do two things with framing your ideas. And that is make sure your community knows that that issue exists and also educate your community about that issue and make, the, make sure that they truly have an understanding of why it's so important. Um, we're going to use the words ideas and issues interchangeably today. Uh, most of the time when you think of an idea, it's going to be a new um, positive thing. And then when you talk about issues, it might be a negative thing that you're trying to make a change with. So we'll start off talking about, you know, what, what is framing an idea? Well, you know, framing an idea is, um, you know, means to define the issue and its context. And there's three very important things to do when you're, uh, you know, beginning to frame uh, your idea. And the first one is going to be make sure that you're framing the issue as a mainstream thing that's not going to be uh, seen as radical, extreme, and make sure you define it clearly. Often we see issues and, and new ideas uh, becoming very political uh, in these days uh, with the political climate. So make sure you're always focusing on the mainstream approach uh, that helps support as many community members as possible. Uh, with doing this, you're gonna see your efforts be a lot more successful. Also make sure you're not making insupportable claims or claims that most people would find extreme or counterintuitive. A great example of this is, uh, you know, when uh, community members say that the reason our organization, I mean, that our community is struggling is because of our local leaders. Well, it's kind of hard to support that if it's truly the local leaders or if there's other external factors. So why not just, you know, really focus on framing your issue on what the problem is and addressing the problem and not necessarily some people in the community. Lastly, where possible, always emphasize common ground and universal or near universal values. A great example of this is, you know, we all want a thriving downtown in our communities. Uh, it's very hard for someone to disagree with, uh, and it's a value that all rural communities can support. So how do we best frame an issue? We're gonna focus on four ways to help win uh, an issue or an idea in your community. First is, you know, making sure that you're enlisting, respecting community members and representatives as spokespersons once you have decided, you know, what issue or idea you wanna take into your community. 
These leaders could be, you know, faith leaders, business leaders, activists, uh, local entertainment or sports figures are very successful in communities because they also have a large social media presence. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, also respected community members. Uh, in my hometown, our uh, former mayor is, you know, someone who's no longer involved in politics or may not necessarily be a leader uh, politically, but he's still a very respected community member. And that's someone that you always want on your side. Um, obviously, elected officials or appointed officials, only if they have a good reputation in your community. That's something that, you know, you can help build those relationships for that elected or appointed official um, to be beneficial to your cause. Uh, also talk to those who have been affected by the issue. A great example of this is I've been to, um, you know, small communities across the Commonwealth where, you know, we've seen them struggling with uh, parking meters in their downtown community. So, you know, when you talk about people who are affected by that issue, first you directly have the customers, you know, they have to pay for a parking meter. So they may not be coming to your, your downtown um, because, you know, they want to be paying that or they don't have coins on them if the small town has not updated to a machine uh, that is able to do do it through a, a credit card. Also think about people that might be indirectly impacted by your issue or indirectly impacted by the, your idea. And those could be the business owners who might not be able to get customers or they're losing customers because you know the, the customers are no longer willing to come to downtown. Lastly, you know, you can really focus on recognized authorities on the issue. Um, you know, this can always get interesting, but the, the big ones you always see is going to be researchers, academics, and professionals. There's lots of great uh, institutions across the Commonwealth that are able to provide you these resources to help your cause, to help your issue, or to help your new idea. Next, we want to talk about always making common ground with other groups. Uh, as you come up with your idea, or as you're, you're uh, framing your, your issue and you start to see uh, you know, you need to grow your support. You should look at other organizations, whether those are, you know, coalitions that are created or creating a new coalition. Obviously, uh, communities or faith are great to uh, get support from uh, and those faith leaders speaking about it uh, through their efforts. Neighborhood organizations are also another uh, great group of, of concerned citizens or citizens who want to be engaged and make their community better. Obviously, nonprofits, state and federal agencies, and other professional organizations will bring a lot of success to your project. One of the most important things you can do is become an authority uh, on your issue. So make sure you're always doing your homework and you need to always be able to demonstrate why, you know, addressing your issue or idea is necessary for the community and why it needs to be addressed in particular ways. Uh, obviously, when you talk about particular ways, you obviously want it to be addressed in the way that you want the project to be completed or you want the project to be changed. If you can't counter your own arguments, maybe you need to rethink your position. Um, you know, maybe some of your thinking is inaccurate and you can go back to framing your issue and finding a way that you can uh, be successful. One of the greatest things you can do is always make sure that you are uh, doing what's best for your community rather than, you know, making yourself look bad uh, by having to say that you were wrong. So always make sure that before you start framing your issue, you become an authority on that issue first. Next, you need to take advantage of opportunities. This may seem pretty simple, but you always need to be able to employ yourself uh, for your knowledge and your status as an expert in that area. Because when people think that you're going to be an expert, uh, they're much more likely to listen to you and they're going to be able to understand what could be done to change the situation. So no, never let a chance of support pass you by where you could be gaining you know, new members for your, your cause or, or your mission. So now we'll talk about eight tools to help better frame your issues. Uh, some of these are free. Some of these take a little bit more time, but this is a great way to, to get started. So first is going to be using the media. By establishing a you know, mutually beneficial relationship with your local newspapers, your radio, uh, your TV, uh, you can get your message out to the public, and often you can do it for free. This is one of the easiest ways to uh, build a base of public support to people that you might not be able to reach uh, you know, in your standard uh, uh, messaging practices. So it's really important to build these relationships. And that's what we're going to talk about in a few slides is how to build relationships. But it's really important that you start building these relationships with your local media outlets today. Second is going to be using the internet. This one's obviously free. And it's great because there's community websites, there's online forums, there's chat groups, there's listservs. And these can all be effective tools for helping building community support, uh, support and keeping people informed. The best thing about the internet as this is also one of the fastest and easiest ways to organize supporters or keep people updated if there's an action that you must take. Next, we, we're going to talk about, you know, gaining support. And one of the things you need to focus on with this is you really do gain support one, uh, you know, one at a time. 
uh, often public support is built through personal contacts uh, and it does take time. So once you have an in individual on board with your uh, idea or your issue in your community that you're trying to frame, um, you could ask them to introduce you to uh, you know, some of their friends or participate in a community presentation with one of their organizations uh, or some local businesses. Um, they may not be willing to do this, but perhaps, you know, they just talk to some of their friends about the issue who will discuss it with their friends. Uh, you can really gain a lot of support through a grassroots effort like this. The thing to remember with gaining support one at a time is people are always going to trust most those who they already know. So you can really gain an, gain an enormous amount of support, especially in a close knit neighborhood or a small town, but where word of mouth is, is honestly the best. So don't miss that opportunity to, to just be reaching out to your friends as well. Next is, is focusing on action, asking people to do something to uh, support your issue or your idea, uh, rather than just telling them about the issue is going to change the way that your, your issue or idea is dealt with in your community. Um, so people are more likely to support your issue if they feel like they can be effective in actually making a change in that issue. So those could be, you know, writing letters, calls, emails to uh, local elected officials or organizations. Um, you could be asking them to, to join a neighborhood group or organization organization that's going to help you support those matters. Uh, it could also just be, you know, asking them to go to a meeting to speak on behalf of, of uh, you know, your efforts. Obviously, volunteering is a great thing to ask community members when you're looking at an idea or an issue in your community, um, or just holding a house party or, or getting some business-based uh, meeting together uh, to address that issue or idea. Next, we're gonna talk about highlighting in it, uh, your, your issues and your ideas. This is a great thing that can be done. And the most important thing about this is anytime you highlight your issue, you should always be doing it in the public and you should be always involving the public. Um, you know, some great examples of this is uh, if there's vacant lots in your, your downtown um, and, you know, they might be dirty, there might be graffiti, you know, organize a, a cleanup of those vacant lots. Uh, you know, whether it be abandoned buildings in your downtown, we've seen on TV a lot of these uh, groups that are going into rural communities uh, on TV shows and trying to help revitalize them, repainting abandoned buildings or, you know, adding murals to your town can really bring a lot of uh, community support and make people feel, feel close to their, uh, their, their local Main Street. Uh, another thing they could do is doing a, you know, a picnic in downtown where you could shut down Main Street and have a picnic or a block party to you know, really attract people to come and see what, what you all have been doing in your communities. Each time you do one of these events, it's very important that first you, you do the event and always invite uh, the media to these events because that's the way you're really gonna get the issue out there to the community. Next, we're going to talk about always recognizing the community. Uh, a lot of community members and a lot of people in your organization or that might be involved with your organization are doing great things already, and there's a way to, to show support for that. So whether it's politicians who are supporting your cause or trying to change policies accordingly, uh, you know, community volunteers who have been sharing your ideas and issues across the community or other organizations and their staff, it's really important to uh, you know, be able to recognize these people. So just giving a simple award or giving them, you know, a recognition ceremony can be very valuable as well. This is another great time to invite the community, um, you know, media, because I've had events where there might only be six, seven, eight people at the event, but all local media outlets were willing to re report on it because it was something for them to talk about that was positive in their community. And, you know, during COVID and times like that, anything that's positive is always going to be something that we want to see in our, our local media. The seventh thing, and this one's interesting for a lot of people, is ceding control of the idea or effort at some point, if it's feasible. Uh, many communities are more willing to support something that they feel like is truly a, a grassroots effort and the entire community is bought into it. So you and your organization should always remain involved, um, but not necessarily as a leader of the effort once the, the issue is framed and, and starts to, to gain a lot of traction. Obviously, this isn't true in every case, and we don't want any issue or idea that's framed and being successful to, to fail but, you know, at some point there is benefit in, in ceding, um, you know, control of, of this issue and letting the, the community run with it from there. And lastly is sustain. Uh, you really need to follow up and maintain support of uh, your current issue, but also so you have a relationship with those people moving forward. Um, you know, don't expect that people are going to, uh, you know, just because you send out a newsletter doesn't mean that, you know, you're really building a relationship and sustaining those relationships. So always continue to work with those groups and find any opportunity to work together. So in summary, you know, framing your ideas, uh, you know, 
extremely crucial to gaining public support and it tends to lead to the credibility of your efforts and your organization. So to do this, make sure you always go back and uh, you know use some of the, the tools we've discussed today, whether that's you know, connecting yourself to respected leaders so that they can serve as spokespeople, becoming an authority and, and really understanding your issue uh, and some of the issues that might be against what, what your organization is supporting. Uh, but then also building common ground with the people and the organizations in your community and taking every opportunity presented to you to really, you know, increase your support in the community. Um, in the chat box, I'd love to hear, you know, maybe some of the projects that you all have worked on uh, in your community that have been positive or or maybe you didn't have success with and you know what you know changing the framing of, of what that issue or idea was you know how that would be successful while you all are thinking of those ideas and feel free to just continue to share them uh we can discuss them definitely at the end of the presentation um you know we'll talk about building relationships um uh, you know relationships are really the building blocks um in any community or organization and relationships are what make communities and, and organizations successful. You know, whether you want to revitalize your downtown or get rid of a policy that you think is negatively impacting your community, you're going to need lots of relationships. And people say, well, you know, why, why do I need those relationships? Well, you know, relationships with your coworkers, your communities that that you serve, or even our adversaries really define if we achieve or if we fail our goals. Um, a lot of us don't like working in isolation, even though during COVID it often feels like we are very isolated, we need to work together. Uh, you know, it's our relationships all together that are going to make the difference. So, you know, we'll talk about a few things, but I just want people to remember that, you know, ordinary people learn skills all the time um, to establish and maintain relationships. But uh, some people would say that whether you're charming, witty uh, or talented, that you don't need to work on your relationships because they just come naturally to you. But I promise you today, even as we, we talk about basic and and uh, more difficult things to be doing in your community, uh, even someone who thinks that, you know, they're charming, witty, and talented, they'll be able to learn a few things today as well. So first, what is relationship building all about? Um, you know, it's very important when we think about relationships that uh, we, we focus on, on two things, and that is, as a community, we're gonna care deeply about people. Uh, you know, it's what we, we care about, and it's why we work so hard to do what we do. Obviously, you know, relationships are the building blocks of these communities, but it's because of the health and happiness of our, our uh, children, our spouses, our coworkers, our neighbors, um, that, you know, we hold fixed in our minds that we can push through any, um, you know, obstacles or take on new challenges for our community. So realize that uh, whether you're an uh, official leader or you're just a member of your organization who's very active and don't have an official title, you'll be most effective in making change in your com community if you have strong relationships in every single uh, aspect of your community. So what are the fundamental reasons, uh, you know, to build relationships for your community? Well, first it's community building occurs one-on-one. -on -one. We kind of talked about this al already, but you know, uh, some people become involved in organizations because they're passionate about the organization or the cause, but you know, a majority of people actually join uh, an organization or support an issue because somebody in their community asked them to be engaged and it's someone that they like. Uh, you know, we also need relationships in order to win allies to our cause. Uh, in order to get support pe from people outside of our organizations, you know, we really need to be building relationships with people we know uh, so that they trust us. And lastly is our relationships, you know, give us meaning and richness to the work and to our lives. Uh, we all need a community of people in our lives um, to help us share our, our joys and our struggles of, of making community change. And, you know, a little bit of, uh, um, you know, friendships and, and positive relationships can really go a long way. So why do we need to build and sustain relationships? Well, we're going to give a quick example here. You know, imagine you're trying to organize a Main Street block party to uh, bring new customers downtown who might not typically shop there. Uh, or you might want to bring outside customers from outside your community. In some rural communities, if the, the downtown hasn't been established for a while, they may be driving to a county over or a town over to experience their downtown versus your communities. So let's talk about a few things with that. You know, who will uh, help you plan this block party? You know, obviously you don't want to uh, do all the planning and late work yourself. Um, if you do, you know, great, great for you, but it would be a lot more fun uh, and much more enjoyable to work with a few local leaders uh, to make this block party happen. So make sure you have, you know, local leaders in your network that you're always trying to build relationships with. Let's talk about how do you get local approval and cooperation for the event? 
well, in many small towns and uh, you know communities, you might have to get city council or you know a government group to approve your block party's uh, permits. Well, having a friend or two in the local governmental office, you know, will help you figure out how to work that bureaucratic system. Um, if you don't know anyone in your current, uh, you know, government offices or things like that, it's a great time to start building those relationships so that when you're when you're in, in a time of need, they're able to help you out. So who else might be able to lend a hand with, uh, you know, planning an event like a, a block party on your on your main street? Well, if you already have a relationship with, you know, your local grocery store, uh, you know, they might be able to donate some watermelon or drinks to your block party. If you know your neighborhood firefighters, they might be able to bring a fire truck to uh, you know, a fire engine for the children to be able to climb, climb on. Or if you know some, you know, farmers in the area, they might be able to provide, you know, hay bales for additional seating in your downtown block party. Lastly, and most importantly, is who's going to come to this block party? Um, for a block party to be successful and for you really to, you know, attract new customers or more customers, you're going to have to have your community support. Um, and neighbors are going to be much more willing to come to your event if, you know, they know someone who is participating in the event or they know someone else who is going. A great example for this for me is, you know, counties that still have county fairs, Clark County does. Well, we all go to the county fair because we know who's going to be there. And, you know, our shyness uh, uh, is going to go away because we're going to feel comfortable with these people. So overall, the more people you know, the easier it will be to organize any issue or idea um, to bring, you know, more attraction to your organization or to your downtown. So, some people may say this sounds self-centered, but everything pretty much starts with you and you'll be the center. So think of yourself as the center or the hub of uh, you know, a wheel and each spoke represents a relationship that you have with another person. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of spokes to make a, a wheel actually be able to turn. So for your organization or for yourself, uh, the more spokes you have, the easier it is for your wheel to turn to achieve your goal, your issue, your idea, uh, or to be successful in your community. The stronger your spokes, the stronger your relationships, the wheel always becomes stronger. The point of this is that you have to be able to sustain the relationships. Once you add a spoke, it's really important to, um, you know, establish the relationship, but then to spend a lot of time, you know, working with them, because if you lose these spokes, then your wheel is not able to move. So now we'll talk about some helpful tips. There's 11 tips here that really can you know help you focus on your your relationships and communities and as first as we've talked about this building relationships uh one by one uh unfortunately or fortunately uh there are no shortcuts with with building these relationships you know sending out that newsletter and making them informed about your organization is not enough so make sure to be reaching out to people in person you know building those those personal relationships uh with the people that you you've already engaged with um you know be friendly and make connections uh, it may seem pretty self-evident, but, you know, everyone wants to, to see someone smile or hear a friendly word uh, from even a stranger, someone they, they already know, but really trying to focus on uh, being friendly and making a single connection with someone can really benefit new relationships for yourself. Make sure to ask people questions. People love talking. They love hearing their voice and they love talking about themselves to make sure that they feel, you know, understood by others. So make sure that you're willing to, to ask, uh, you know, questions when you're building these relationships. Also tell people about yourself. You need to be able to trust. People need to be able to trust you. So they need to learn about you and make sure that your values match theirs, your organization's values match theirs. And they can also just learn about you to, to see other areas about, about your life and to make you more personable. Make sure to go places and do things. Uh, growing up, my grandfather would always tell me that, you know, uh, if you ever ask a robber why they rob a bank, they'll tell you it's because that's where the, the money's at. So if, if you're trying to build relationships, you got to go places where people are going to be that you want to build relationships with. So that could be, you know, going to little league games, bowling alleys, playgrounds, fundraisers, uh, you know, conferences, picnics. You need to be in the places uh, of the relationships that you're trying to build. So make sure that you're getting out there in the community. Also accepting people for uh, who they are. You know, you don't have to agree with absolutely everyone in your community um, to be able to form a relationship with them, but no one wants to be judged. You also need to, uh, you know, be able to assume that other people want to form relationships too. Uh, even the crabbiest person in in a community is just looking for, you know, someone to understand their their issues and their struggles. So make sure that, you know, no matter who you're talking to, assume that they're want, wanting to form relationships as well. Also, overcome your fear of rejection. 
this is a hard one for a lot of people because most of us suffer from that fear uh, of rejection in our personal and professional lives. So to get these rich relationships that you want for your organization or for yourself, you really just need to honestly get over it. And it's, it's hard because on it, Honestly, we're all going to be rejected at least once or twice, but the rich relationships you'll get from all those people who wanted to build relationships will be extremely successful. Also being persistent. Uh, it takes time um, and people are often shy or suspicious when, uh, you know, building new friendships because of, you know, their past. So really focus on uh, with organizations, just being persistent and showing that you're there, you're committed and you're wanting to reach out and be engaged. Invite. Oh, did someone say something? Well, invite people to get involved. Uh, as we talked about with, uh, you know, framing an issue, it's a great thing to do to get people involved. And you shouldn't fear rejection if these people are going to say no, because, uh, you know, often when you're inviting someone to get involved, they find it as a compliment and it's very flattering to them. But lastly, is, is always going to be to enjoy people. And this is a very important one. Uh, if you genuinely enjoy people, others will be attracted to you and your attitude. And people will more likely want to be around you. So how do you build relationships with people of different cultural backgrounds than your own? I thought this was important to discuss. Um, so, you know, we'll jump right into it, but it's about learning about that person's culture, being willing to, to ask questions and show that you're curious and that you want to build that relationship with them will really make a difference in your community. It's also putting yourself at the center of another person's culture. Uh, a lot of times in, in rural communities, uh, we might be in the majority culture. Uh, and as people are moving to our communities, we, we don't understand uh, the cultural events that they're having. So instead of you know, just talking to them, go to an event with them, go to you know, a cultural event or a community group that they're involved with and, and put yourself in their shoes and, and show them that you're trying to engage. And uh, it may make you feel uncomfortable, but people are always much more inclined to get to know you when you're willing to put yourself in their shoes. Uh, you can also take a stand against uh, the person's oppression. Um, you know, actions are always going to speak louder than words. And, uh, you know, we've seen people who experience oppression, you know, they need allies at times. Uh, so showing that you're willing to stand up for them will help you build a strong relationship and, and support them as well. Lastly, it's OK to make mistakes. You know, I, I grew up in Clark County and I went to Virginia Tech and there were lots of cultural differences. And then I moved to D.C. for a bit and I learned so many more cultural differences. And obviously, along the way, I made mistakes. But it's very uh, interesting because when you're trying and you're trying to learn about that person's culture, they're much more understanding to, uh, you know, your mistakes. And they're going to remember to, to, you know, just hang in there when you feel rejected or you feel like you've made a mistake in that relationship. Obviously, once you've built all these relationships, you need to restrain them, whether you've had a whether you've had a friend for you know two or three years or a colleague or an organization that you've had a relationship with for you know a few years or they've been someone with you for your entire life it's very important that you're always sustaining these relationships so you don't lose those spokes in your wheel the first thing you need to do is make sure you're paying attention to people take a few minutes a week and just send emails texts phone calls and reach out to people and figure out you know how, how they're doing you can talk about your personal life their organization that you're connected with them and but you know just making sure that you're truly paying attention to them and not just notify nine notifying them about your issues or your organization or the ideas that the organization is trying to push this will make a huge difference and you'll realize a lot a lot more people will start reaching out to you as well you need to be able to communicate openly uh, all people need to communicate and it's a good idea just to set aside time you know every day or every week just to have conversations with the people around you this could be your your coworkers, and you could be talking about your uh you know organization and how they feel things are going for them but just building up that communication and it's it's a discipline that's hard uh, it's just like you know working out or eating healthy if you don't do it uh, regularly you won't get the results that you're expecting obviously appreciating each other we talked about this in framing issues uh, as well about getting awards, but just telling someone, uh, you know, that they've done a good job, whether, you know, you saw a, a coworker last week in a board meeting really uh, be successful or, you know, someone in an organization who's been volunteering a lot, just let them know that they're appreciated and this will encourage them to stay engaged and they'll also attract them uh, to you more. Be willing to extend yourself as well. Uh, going out a little bit out of your way uh, can really make a huge impact on a lot of other people. You might have a coworker who, uh, has been trying to spend more time with her kids during COVID right now. And you could allow that person to go home early so that, you know, you can finish up the grant that they're applying for or, or some of the work that they're doing. 
These are things that people often never forget, even though it may seem like a small gesture, just being able to extend yourself a little bit will make people, uh, you know, the, the relationship you have with them stronger. Volunteer to do work uh, for, you know, their organization or, or for their causes or efforts. Um, a lot of times we often focus on, on our organization because that's our life day in and day out, but being willing to, to reach out and say, hey, I'm here to support you. You know, what can I do to volunteer and give some time? Uh, this also uh, lets them know that when you have an event, you know, they're more likely to volunteer because they saw you help them. So now they're going to want to return the favor. Also, you need to challenge each other to do better. Um, you know, we all need someone in our lives who's uh, helping us stretch beyond uh, what we think is possible for ourselves. Um, and, you know, we can build stronger relationships by doing this, by challenging our, our work partners or our organizational leaders to, to bigger challenges to, to be successful. Um, also, you need to back each other up when, when things get tough. Uh, it's really important to know that you have someone to, to help you out. Loyalty is essential to uh, sustaining relationships. So really focusing on, um, you know, supporting our local leaders or uh, local communities when, when they're in a jam. So I would love for, you know, people to write in the chat, you know, what are some of the best relationships you have in your community or what are other community uh, groups, organizations, or, or people that, uh, you know, you want to build relationships with? Uh, we're, we have one more section and we'll get to questions and we can discuss some of the, the things in the chat box. So now we'll talk about mobilizing your resources. Um, you know, when most people think about this, they're going to be thinking about financial. So we want to talk about, you know, what exactly this is. So what is resource mobilization? Well, you know, this refers to all activities involved in securing additional resources or uh, assets for your organization. It also involves making better use of or maximizing uh, existing resources and assets. Um, but resource, resource mobilization can tend to be grouped into four issues. Uh, it's going to be human, social, physical, and financial. So now we'll discuss what those uh, resources are. Um, you know, for human resources, without people, um, there would be no organization, there would be no community, there'd be no ideas for us to make a difference uh, in our towns. When organizations uh, are mapping out their, their resources, they often don't consider their human resources that might already be available or other human resources in their community that they've never thought about to help them advance uh, their organization's mission. Um, you know, some of these can include existing staff, members of your board, uh, you know, any advisors, volunteers, also members of the community that you've been engaging with and you haven't necessarily asked them, you know, what they can be doing for, um, you know, your organization. Uh, individuals who live and work in the community, uh, you know, they are the human resources of every single uh, area that you go. So be curious, make sure you're talking to members in your community, uh, having understanding, asking questions to learn more about them. And you might find talents in your community or passions or knowledge that can really benefit your organization. So some of the human resources out there is, you know, offering support and commitment to your organization. This could be financial support, but it's the relationship, uh, the human resource that got you this effort. You know, uh, it could be encouraging involvement in your organization or, you know, people just going out there and engaging um, and other organizations and saying, hey, this is why I'm here. Uh, obviously, supporting fundraising efforts is extremely important, volunteering uh, or any community efforts that you have. Social resources, uh, you know, these tend to be groups in your community um, and creating coalitions uh, often come from your social resources. So it's very important that you uh, have an understanding of, of who is there. Um, also, when, when you build social resources, you do uh, typically result in the sharing of or the building of physical, financial, uh, and, and other resources. Um, it could also be, it could also result in identifying shared needs with other organizations where you're spending financial resources and they're spending financial resources, and you can now work together or access additional, um, you know, resources for your, your uh, organization. When you think of social resources, think of all your community organizations, your religious groups, your educational institutions, or alumni associations. This is a great place to start uh, to consider what social resources you have in your community and how to mobilize them, which we'll also talk about a bit. We can also talk about physical resources. These are, you know, uh, something that many rural communities might not see them really having, such as the urban areas, but there's so many, uh, you know, rural resources that fall in the physical resources category that really make uh, 
a competitive advantage for rural communities. This could be, you know, your natural resources, any agrarian um, or other natural resources in your community, buildings that you have, land, raw materials, and supplies. Lastly, we'll talk about financial resources. This is obviously what everyone thinks of when they think of, uh, you know, mobilizing resources or needing more resources for their organization. So, um, you know, we just want to make it clear that the most important thing you can do is understand that resource mobilization is not just the mobilization of, of financial needs or fundraising. Um, you know, fundraising solely relies on economic or financial resources, and all these additional resources are what's going to get your, your community and your organization to be in better shape. But when we do consider financial organizations, obviously your nonprofit organizations that are uh, grant givers or uh, you know, have funds, private foundations, corporations, uh, citizen donations, and you also have things like state agencies or other quasi-agency organizations that are willing to support your efforts. So let's talk about effective resource mobilization. What, you know, makes it uh, effective? Uh, first, you need to realize that it is necessary to create an enabling environment to uh, ensure that you can have effective uh, resource mobilization. So. Why do we need to have an enabling environment? It's because we don't want to lose uh, current contributors that are willing to donate to your organizations. A lot of times when someone starts donating or an organization starts donating, uh, that ask level stays the same uh, every year. And, and you know that's the method. But if you, if you have an environment that is going to be successful and you're effectively uh, mobilizing your resources, you should be able to increase that funding. Uh, it's also, like I said, you know, receiving larger contributions from those existing contributors. Uh, you know, having an enabling environment is also going to help you gain new contributors or also obtain short and long term diversified resources that are going to help build your organization's sustainability. I just want to talk about that real quick. So with, uh, you know, uh, obtaining short term, um, you know, resource mobilization, those might be your uh, you know, personal relationships. Those might be your social organizations. Those might be physical products, but it helps diversify your organizational uh, stability because you can use those resources for your long-term goals. So building and focusing on short-term resources and long-term resources is extremely important. So to create this enabling environment and to mobilize your resources, what are some things you need to do? Well, first is setting out you know, a roadmap and actually sitting down with people in your organization, sitting down with leaders in your organization um, or you know, people in your community and realizing what's there. Some people may call this a st strategic plan. You can do a SWOT analysis, but I just want to leave it at roadmap because every community is going to prefer a different method. But having an understanding of what, what you have, what you uh, want, and what you need is extremely important. Next, you need to be able to list uh, the resources needed for each of your organization's projects. So whether you're trying to attract new people to your organization, whether you are trying to uh, you know, bring in more funds, whether you're trying to build a stronger coalition so your organization can be more successful when an issue or an idea comes up, you should start to consider not just the financial resource for the projects, but how many more you know, people do you need? What new relationships do you need? Uh, and actually list out those resources so that when you look at each um, you know, project or, or uh, aspect of, of your organization, you have an understanding of where your resources are strongest and where you can focus some effort on, on uh, new areas for resources. You also need to be able to know how the organization is going to mobilize your resources. Uh, this is all about efficiencies and, and having an understanding of, are you spending your resources in the best possible areas? Uh, to, to know this, you know, it's sitting down and, and having understanding. If, you, if you're spending a lot of money on an area and not gaining new resources, maybe you could divert funds to a new area or come up with a new idea that you think might bring in additional resources with the resources that you're mobilizing. Also, just making sure that you've built a team of staff and volunteers that have an understanding of this. It's extremely important for people to understand that uh, if their job does not deal with fundraising, they're still able to help mobilize new resources or bring in new resources, such as those uh, new people, those new organizations, or new physical products. And also start managing a diversified budget. Uh, when I say diversified, it's to have an understanding of if you only have three or four financial or um, you know, resources coming in, you need to start bringing in small donors or, or other opportunities for um, you know, donations. Because if you lose one large donor with your financial resources, it's extremely hard to make up that gap. So you need to start diversifying and managing a diversified budget now. 
So now we'll talk about the three main components of uh, resource management and, and, and mobilizing this. That's going to be, you know, um, assessing your existing wealth. It's generating new wealth and then expanding non-financial resources. Obviously, the expanding of non-financial resources is something I definitely want to talk about, just so that people have an understanding and, and can start to focus on things other than the financial aspect. So how do we, uh, you know, assess our, our existing wealth? Well, first, you know, obviously co cultivating relationships and, and gaining additional financial, um, you know, money and other resources from our current network. That's something that we can all be doing uh, today. Um, continue to build those relationships and do that. Um, coming up with new ideas or directions for a dis, uh, existing fundraising initiatives is extremely important. Uh, there's always the ability to uh, do a SWOT analysis or uh, you know run a, a balance sheet or whatever and have an understanding of your existing fundraising initiatives and really start to focus on um, what's going to be new or the direction. When you do this, make sure to engage your old donors. Make sure to engage new donors because it's going to give you a new pool of funds. You know, building a coalition or a collaboration with other organizations is something we briefly talked about, but it's extremely important because it's going to show you, uh, you know, their funding sources that they're they're getting, um, or give you access to additional social, uh, physical, or financial resources that you might not be thinking of. Also, you can always collaborate together and share the costs, so you're not using all of your, um, you know, you're not mobilizing all of your resources to to an effort, but still having the impact that you would have had if you had to do it yourself. Revisiting budget efficiencies, it's something I do with every organization uh, that I've been engaged with. I ran seven statewide trade organizations um, before my job with the Rural Center, and this is something that it's, it's extremely important to do. Mobilizing your resources isn't, isn't always focused on getting something new. Uh, you know, it can be focused on using your, your current uh, resources more efficiently. We talked about that roadmap and creating a strategic plan, uh, focusing on creating jobs, uh, or creating ob objectives, targets, and, and uh, potential uh, sources of new resources, um, and you know, being focused on on bringing th those to your community. And lastly, is you know, reaching out to experts or, or uh, advisors in in these these areas. This is uh, a resource when you talk about uh, you know people in your community and human resources. Uh, you're going to have experts in your community who are uh, experts in uh, fundraising, experts in um, you know, financial management experts in uh, marketing and, you know, just really reaching out to some experts or advisors in your community can really help with your fundraising efforts. So talking about generating new wealth, when we think of uh, new wealth for, um, you know, organizations, we're going to come to four groups that we're going to focus on. And that's going to be our individual contributors, co uh, corporations, the sponsors, uh, our events and, and promotion efforts, and then grant giving agencies and nonprofits. These four groups are all very different in a lot of ways. We'll discuss that a little bit, but you always need to be thinking about that group's requirements or needs. Uh, this is in terms of you know, the goals, their missions, their concerns, and their timing. A great example for this is when you look at grant giving agencies or nonprofits, they're gonna have deadlines, they're gonna have reports that are gonna be due, and these are all things that you can map out on your calendar today. Um, and it's extremely important to do all this because there's gonna be lapses um, in your day-to-day -day life where you could be focused on some of these other areas but if a grant is due on february 15th you need to you know allocate time way before february 15th to start working on that um, and then when you don't have grants to do where you don't have reports for a grant or um, some money you got from a nonprofit due you can focus on those individual uh contributions or you know some corporate sponsors uh same thing with events you know having a goal of raising a certain amount of money from uh, individual contributors and having an event is a great thing that you could pair together. But if you also have goals from corporate sponsors and you have a big event coming up, you're not able to give 100% of your time to what your efforts are. So really think about the group's requirements and needs, uh, whether they be the, their goals, their missions, the concern, or the timing of, of these events, and uh, putting that all down on, on paper. Also make sure you focus on the why of each group. Obviously, individual uh, contributors and corporate sponsors are going to have different reasons on why they want to give. I will say that all four groups, uh, you know, whether it be uh, the Virginia Rural Center or, or um, you know, any of your organizations, we all want to make an impact and a difference in our community. But you need to have an understanding of that. So, you know, really just acquiring knowledge, understanding and information about that organization, that person, and building that relationship is focused on, uh, you know, an individual feeling heard, an uh, uh, individual feeling understood, and an individual feeling appreciated. So you need to acquire knowledge on all this. And 
uh, understanding and information. And lastly is knowing your supporters' values. Anytime that you can tie your values to your supporter, you're gonna help build that relationship and they're gonna be more willing to give to you. One of the most uh, exciting ones for me to talk about is you know, how to expand non-financial resources. And this is extremely important. Uh, oftentimes when we get told no uh, from a uh, financial uh, group that we were just talking about, you know, that's the end of the conversation, but you always uh, need to have a second ask. And typically, uh, non-financial resources should be your, your second ask, unless you know that organization isn't able to give. Um, so some of these could be, you know, with human resources, providing those technical skills. I've worked with groups that do uh, audits for, um, you know, for-profit and non-profit organizations, and I've reached out to them and said, hey, you know, we, we would love to just get, you know, an audit of our, our books, and they provide that resource for free. Um, so it can also just be volunteering, you know, coming out to an event or getting engaged with that. There's also social resources that they can provide you. Uh, a lot of times, if you're talking to an organization or, or a donor that isn't able to give, they can connect you to other donors or organizations. You know, getting told no that they can't give, that's not the end. You need to have the second ask, and it's really important uh, to, to focus on. And lastly is physical resources. We talked about this in the relationships. So if you knew your local grocery store, then providing, you know, a product that they produce or that they have in store is something that can be beneficial and at least gives you a, a new connection and you can build that relationship from you know them just giving you some some products into a solid relationship where they give you money as well uh, you know it could also be things like equipment so <clears throat> to, to end everything up for mobilizing resources there's 10 things you need to remember you know organizations are not entitled to support and they really must earn it uh, you know successful resource mobilization requires a lot of work it's going to require a lot of time so as you're building these relationships, really start mapping uh, you know, out what resources you have, what resources you want, and what resources you need. Um, if your organization needs additional revenue, uh, you know, a financial resource today or in a year from now, you really need to start today. Um, and be able to sell yourself in the programs that you're raising money for at absolutely any time. As you build friends, you know, this is something that they may ask you about. You need to be prepared for that. Realize that real resource mobilization should align with your mission, uh, objectives, and strategic plan, and that it needs to be about uh, the needs of your prospective funder. Uh, just because your mission is, is is great and everyone supports it, if your funder doesn't support it, you know they're not going to give to you. Uh, make sure you understand the needs of your community. This is extremely important, and uh, not just uh, your community in the sense of the target population, but also those funders. Um, be prepared, uh, prepared to provide evidence-based results. Uh, whether it's people, organizations, or uh, corporations or companies, they all want to have evidence-based results. And make sure that you're to understand that your performance today does impact your ability to generate resources tomorrow. Uh, and lastly is, you know, you must establish and maintain organizational credibility and reputation if you want to continue to generate new resources. So at this time, uh, I'd love to answer questions uh, or address any of the issues. And I'd also love to hear from um, you all if there's any resources in your community that you know you find to be really powerful or successful, um, or what or what resources do you want to see in your community that you currently don't have? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and these are great questions. And so for everyone, you know, we've got a, a small enough uh, crowd today. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, we, can, uh, um, we can address your, your questions directly. So let's, uh, let me just at least, if I'm offering that, make sure that uh, I'm tuned in to when somebody does do something like that. But, um, you know, Chris, you really landed on a lot of great information that aligns nicely with uh, Main Street efforts. I mean, first of all, we're really looking at uh, um, a lot of asset management here, asset exploration, and then tapping into those appropriately. And at the foundation of Main Street, we're looking at asset-based economic development. And so you're always building off of the things that already exist. Um, so uh, related to that, I'm curious, how has the pandemic affected opportunities to build relationships and grow resources? So you know, what are some of the ways uh, community organizations have found their way around these barriers. I mean, I welcome any thoughts from you, Chris, uh, but then the audience uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been difficult because before we were able to interact with people uh, much more so 
um, you know, in person. And when you're in person, you're able to, to share, uh, be more vulnerable and just have a stronger connection. So what we've seen is uh, groups that have been successful organizations or people that have been really been successful, it's intentional now. You know, they, they are making an intentional effort, um, you know, to, to really continue those relationships or build new relationships. And I think that's really important, you know, uh, making this an intentional effort that you're doing every single day for your organization and for your own health uh, to continue to build and sustain those relationships. Yeah. Um, you know, related to that, I've got some great resources just to point out to everyone. Um, uh, Main Street America has a great guide, uh, which includes tools to explore your entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we're really looking at asset mapping in that case within the context of entrepreneurs. You know, really looking at that environment that makes it easier for um, a new business uh, to locate or an existing one to grow uh, within your district. So there's some wonderful tools around really exploring that and mapping out these solutions. There's also a great resource similar to that around engaging community. Um, so uh, if you all aren't a member of the National Maystreet Center, those resources are, are out there um, uh, for, for easy download and something to share. As a matter of fact, Main Street America has a, a number of, of webinars uh, pre-recorded that uh, you could, could view uh, in order to tap into um, uh, or at least get a deeper understanding. Also want to let you know that um, in order to appeal, and this is directly related to what Chris was just saying a moment ago, in order to appeal to prospective funders, um, it, it's important to develop that case for support. Um, so that statement. And so there's some good exercises out there just by searching it, case or support, that can really help you think through the needs of your community uh, or, or your stakeholders, and then even guide you through crafting um, the best way to deliver that information. So framing your issue and your ideas. So uh, there are some tools out there directly related to what, what Chris is talking about um, to, uh, to deploy these, uh, these great ideas. Hey, um, um, Kyle, I, I like, yeah, uh, no, would like to uh, follow up with, with Chris regarding the relationships. It's almost, yeah, COVID has caused us, um, caused a strain on us to be able to meet in person. But I think it also has given us an opportunity to be much more proactive with these relationships via this. Um, and it really makes those in-person meetings instead of following up from a month the last time we saw each other, it's about following up two weeks ago when we had our Zoom meeting. And it, I think it's really building the relationships. Even if you, I'm noticing it, making it easier to um, keep those relationships. I, I don't know. It, it, it's different, but I, I think it's actually um, making things more, I don't know, relationships stronger. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm curious, you know, nowadays we're seeing a real uh, mixture, a hybrid way of communicating, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations um, as all of us adjust to, to the changes and our comfort level. Um, Luke, are you, are you seeing that with your deployment of, of Main Street in Pulaski as well? And what, what are you guys doing to sort of balance that the human touch and person kind of stuff with um with the virtual side of things it just allows us to have even more meetings <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. i mean there, there's no excuse for people not to actually be interacting and to be part of the conversation um with this i don't know if it this, if this would be the if video chatting like this would be so common had it not been for uh for covid um mm -hmm. Or, or even for us to be comfortable doing it as often as we are. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And uh, with in downtown Pulaski, it's, you know, you have Friends of Pete Creek, a local nonprofit that cleans up uh, part of the New River Conservancy. You have the Rotary Club. You have Pulaski on Main, the Virginia Main Street affiliate. You have a local group doing the CDBG program that meets uh, every month. You have different organizations. And before it felt like, butter on toast trying to take part in all these because you're just spread so thin but now it's um i don't know every, everyone all of them can kind of overlap and you can it feels 
it's still overwhelming, but not nearly as bad when you can, when you can do it from home. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's what, when we get into, you know, whether uh, a meeting should be in person or um, uh, virtual, there, there are things to think about in that case. Sometimes, depending on comfort level, it's important to have that in-person uh, uh, piece, especially when you're trying to develop relationships, um, grow them, uh, build trust. That kind of um, face-to-face uh, uh, opportunity really is better over, uh, over a virtual situation. Uh, a virtual situation, you know, obviously could break down barriers with travel, you know, if you were looking at a, a resource. Um, and so uh, gathering virtually really, uh, you know, may be the best scenario. But, you know, some of the stuff that I found is just a matter of, of Googling the right kind of question. And you'll find all sorts of great resources in order to think through uh, the best time to have an in-person or the best time to have that virtual uh, situation. Um, you know, Chris, I'm curious, and this would be a question for you, because I'm always looking for great examples. So within the leadership development, what's the time from your experience where an organization did a great job of connecting to the community and motivating residents to give time and possibly money to participate in the change, the revitalization or impacts. Does anything come to mind that really, um, uh, really, really might be a great example uh, of this? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's there's definitely um, you know times where, where community organizations have been really really engaged. Um, you know, we talk about the SOAP Innovation Hub uh, quite a bit, and you know Microsoft's involvement in that. But that was the communities working together, and it wasn't just South Boston. You know, Farmville was engaged in that. Uh, Longwood University, um, Hampton Sydney University. Uh, there, I believe Farmville has a Main Street program, correct? Um, yep. And, uh, Jen, I can't think of her name, uh, but she works at Longwood. So yeah, they really engaged the community and they found out what would be best. And uh, it was interesting to to hear and learn about uh, you know the decisions. Yeah, Jen Cox, thank you very much. There we go. Thanks, and, Rebecca. <laughs> but, you know, they they really worked together and they they decided what was best for the community. It wasn't just the local community. I mean, Farmville was involved with South Boston and, um, you know, engaged with that. I just think it was very uh, unique to see the relationships that they built and the uh, leaders that came together and said, you know, no matter where this ends up, uh, you know, we're all going to benefit from this. And I think that's what we need to focus on is, is what's going to benefit the most people in the community possible. Yeah, Chris, that's great. And just to let everybody know, a little bit of crossover here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had our um, road show. Um, and it highlighted all of uh, our resources in the our division of economic development and community vitality. And um, so uh, there are some great stories in there to hear uh, very you know uh, direct stories of of application and of those uh, products from uh, from the communities. But South Boston, um, Tam Rivest and Tom Robb, so the the the, the the uh, Main Street executive director and the town manager um, talked about how they layer all of those together and bring stuff together. So um, it's at the very end of the, a two hour webinar, but you know, um, they give some great tips about that experience that Chris is referencing specifically. So um, that's great. Well, Chris, um, you know, I think we could keep on talking. Um, but I know we've got a little bit of information to share first before we close everything out in, in the next 10 minutes. Did uh, you have some more information to share uh, before we move on? Yeah, I'll, sh I'll share some quick slides just so you can see. I'm not going to hit every slide just to be respectful of people's time, but I want to tell you a little bit about our, our leadership program and then uh, a potential opportunity for, for you all to be engaged in it. So, um, you know, the organization I'm with is the Virginia Rural Leadership Institute under the Virginia Rural Center. Uh, and you can see with our branding here, we we chose a, a barn quilt because we wanted to, to focus on most rural communities having an agrarian root, but we've seen an uprising of the barn quilt and you know what it's representing in the revitalization in communities. And the colors of, of the barn quilt are uh, from the Virginia flag because we want to represent the entire Commonwealth. So I'll just tell you the purpose. Uh, you've seen it once on a slide that Kyle showed you. I'll talk about a community impact project and that being the focus of our our program on top of uh, leadership and then what the 20, 2022 program is going to look like. 
So the you know, mission of our organization is to retain, attract, and develop rural Virginians into innovative, responsible, and civic-minded leaders who are going to help build strong communities. People always ask us, you know, what type of participant would be perfect for this program? Uh, typically, I can talk about this for five minutes, but I'll make it extremely quick. Um, there is no perfect candidate in the sense of what we're looking for. The perfect candidate will just support being committed to retaining, uh, you know, developing and attracting rural leaders. So uh, we have individuals who have applied who are right out of college, all the way up to people who are retired, um, you know, for the past 10 years and are still committed to retaining, developing and attracting rural leaders. So, you know, whether you're the public sector, the private sector, or you're with a community group, uh, we would love to for you all to be considered in this program. So the Community Impact Project, I often refer to it as a CIP, so I'm sorry it's a bad habit of me always saying CIP, but when I do say that, that's our Community Impact Project, and we'll talk about what, what that is exactly. So, you know, for, for us, we're hoping that all of our Community Impact Projects will be short term, uh, you know, roughly one year long, um, and it's an opportunity to provide uh, leadership skills and put those into practice in your community, help you build those relationships that you're trying to build with your organization already and acquire uh, firsthand experience in making a difference in rural communities. The great thing about most of you is you've done a lot of these things. So, so your community impact project could, could really make a difference. And, um, you know, why did we choose to do CIPs? Um, well, first is it provides an immediate return on investment. So lots of organizations, stakeholder groups, uh, you know, companies, corporations, they want to invest in this program, but they obviously want to want to see something uh, from it. Uh, other leadership programs uh, have a long list of alumni for the past, you know, 45 years, 30 years. Uh, we don't have that. So we want to have an immediate return on our investment to show rural communities, you know, why our program is great. Obviously, you're going to build professional skills, uh, valuable uh, contacts, and you're going to be able to, you know, just become a more effective leader in economic development and the wider community in your area. So just so you have an understanding of what a community impact project is, First, we you know, help you assess your community uh, and have an understanding of the needs in your community, but also you know, what your community wants. Sometimes your community might need something, but they may not want it. So you know, it's really uh, you know, focusing on this assessment process. We've worked with uh, Virginia Tech um, and Appalachian State University to uh, you know, come up with this uh, five-step process. This is a common uh, you know, process, but come up with the questions, the, the experience to make sure that you know, we're heading in the right direction. Obviously, you'll, you'll plan after that. It will help you come up with your plan for your community impact project. Then you'll act on your plan. Um, you know, and when you graduate the program, that's when you actually start acting on your plan. So you spend the, the one year with us and you, you assess your community and you plan. Uh, then you start acting on it. Uh, then you need to be able to evaluate it. Every single community impact project, it might change as you go through the process. You know, your community might start to, um, you know, head in a different direction. If you didn't frame your issue correctly, you might, or, you know, you've realized uh, through your framing process that things are changing and that's okay. So you just need to be able to evaluate it and move the goalposts if you need to. And lastly is all of our community impact projects must be sustainable. So we have uh, leaders from, um, you know, our community and stakeholder organizations who are going to make sure that every community impact project that, that um, you know, our cohort selects is going to be sustainable. So this is just what the booklet's going to look like. We won't talk about this too much just because uh, we only have seven minutes left in time. But just want to let everyone know that there will be a hard copy book that you get that we're creating. We're in the final stages of it. Um, that's going to address all these questions about different issues in your community and how to address them, but also give you an understanding of your community that you may not have had in the past. You'll also have this in a digital version. Um, Kyle can tell you about uh, Vermont. They have a, a similar booklet, but ours is going one step further. And we're, we've been excited to work with uh, stakeholder organizations on this as we start getting into the final drafts of this opportunity. So people always ask what, what a community impact project look like. Well, uh, the great thing about community impact projects is they can be based on the cohort members network and experience. So you see things like creating an innovation hub, um, you know, Obviously, they, they've done that down with the SOV Innovation Hub, and that was a, a large project that, that you know, occurred. But we don't want to um, limit uh, anyone based on their network or experience. So you see a large list here um, of different options, but this is not an exhaustive list. But we want you to have an impact either economically or on community development in your community and us tie you to those resources to help you out. So this is what the program is going to look like. We launched November 4th. Um, uh, Luke was actually there at that. Uh, so that was exciting to see, you know, community leader, leaders hear about the program. Our applications are due March 15th. Our cohort will be selected in mid-April. And then our sessions are mid-May, mid-July, mid-September, and mid-November. 
Um, in between each session, you do see some Zoom calls. And this is a chance for us to tie you to experts or, or leaders in the field of your community impact project. So you can also expand your network that also helps you, um, you know, sec uh, secure success uh, with your project. We also have funders who, uh, you know, will participate in these Zoom calls and, and help you, um, you know, secure funding for your projects or, uh, you know, work with other community groups to, to get the needs that you, you have. Everyone always asks what the program costs. So our uh, um, inaugural cohort will be no more than 30 members. We're going to be focused on quality over quantity, and we really want to ensure that our first inaugural class, that we can engage with them and have very successful community impact projects. It's costing us as an organization $3,500 per cohort member. Um, but for our initial um, class, we, we are already providing a subsidy of $1,000 off of your uh, tuition because we want to show you that the Virginia Rural Leadership Institute is investing in you right off the bat. So we're only going to charge a tuition of uh, $2,500 and that rate is only going to be locked in for 2022 and uh, going in future years, you know, we'll, we'll consider it based on, you know, cost benefit analysis. When people talk about uh, you know, where, what locations will be going to. The program is four sessions. So you're going to go to all four of these locations. You see the dates on there as well. Uh, but our first session is in Southside at the B Hotel. Our second session is in Middle Peninsula Northern Neck at St. Margaret's School. Um, interesting opportunity there where there aren't as many revitalized uh, medium-sized hotels uh, in the community. So uh, St. Margaret's School is a private school um, where they do boarding. And during the summer, they, they provide, you know, executive leadership conferences and opportunities to go to the university. So it's uh, the school. So it's a unique time to talk about how education can play a role in uh, rural communities. Um, for session three, we're going Jack Jackson Park Inn. Thanks, Luke, for that. Um, so we'll be there on September 15th, 16th. And then on the 16th, we'll drive down to Western Front Hotel in St. Paul. And I saw that the, the St. Paul uh, team jumped on. So we're excited to to work with you and we'll do that. And then our graduation will be at the Blackburn Inn uh, in Stanton. Just in the, in the essence of times, the three things we're gonna focus on is teaching you leadership skills, uh, teaching you rural issues that many of you already have an understanding of, and then putting those into practice through exercises. So here's a long list of some of the things you'll learn about from basic things with, uh, you know, intro to leadership philosophy, understanding your leadership style, all the way to difficult things about how to navigate power structures and, you know, how to have difficult conversations with, uh, you know, yourself or other, other organizations. With the issues, we, we're trying to be all encompassing. So if you don't see it here, I'm sure a portion of our program will still talk about it. And then with our exercises, it actually just gives you a chance to put what you're learning through our program into practice. Um, so at this time, I'd love to take questions uh, or we, Kyle can talk about uh, the, the opportunity. Yeah, let us let me uh, share my screen real quick. And then, uh, so everybody hold tight. Uh, I've got some good information here that you want to hear. That slide's popping up right now. So uh, to, for those of you who are around yesterday, you, 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 I've already alluded to this, but the, we've got some great news. Uh, Virginia Main Street will offer four scholarships to the Virginia Rural Leadership Institute for the upcoming cohort. Um, that ap application is still under development, so more information to come on that. However, we will be uh, we will make four scholarships available to advancing uh, Virginia advancing Main Street uh, uh, programs communities. So we're looking at the designated communities as well as exploring Main Street communities. So interested candidates must apply for and be accepted into the VRLI cohort first and then apply for the scholarship. So we'll, you know, you've got a little bit of time here, but just keep this on, in the back of your mind or mark it on your calendar. To apply for the scholarships, these candidates must be current with uh, Virginia Main Street quarterly reporting and grant reporting. So just uh, uh, be mindful about those things. Uh, dollars will not be available for this until July 1st, 2022. So more information is coming soon about that. So stay tuned through the Virginia Main Street monthly newsletter. If you're not uh, signed up for that, please let us know. Um, and the blog, so virginiamainstreet.com, where you can also learn about downtown management, best practices, local stories, funding opportunities, and upcoming events across the Commonwealth. Sign, go ahead and sign up to receive posts in the bottom right-hand corner of the landing page. That way, you know, you don't, uh, every time there's a new post, um, you'll get a you'll get a nice reminder, um, uh, or just or, or visit the site when you get an opportunity. VirginiaMainStreet.com. So, Chris, thank you 
for bringing all this together. This is such important information for uh, everyone to hear. It's great information in order to really kind of think forward about the new year, really picture what you all want to accomplish uh, by the end of 2022 and, um, and, and start working towards those projects and applying some of these ideas. Uh, even diving in full heartedly into uh, um, wholeheartedly into the the leadership institute. So, thank you, uh, Chris, so much. And um, let's see. Lastly, whoop, of course, got to have. Um, all right, there we go. Last slide. So, if you have any questions, please reach out to DHCD's Community Revitalization Office staff. Extended Economic Development and Community Vitality Family. Hyper, uh, hi, these hyperlinks will be active in the webinar handout. Speaking of, Chris, when you get an opportunity, if you'll email me a PDF of your presentation, whatever is easiest to actually get through uh, uh, the internet to me, um, we'll get that uh, all put together here with the information and posted very quickly on virginiamainstreet.com and the training resources. So with that, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay on uh, a few more minutes. Sounds like Chris, you cool with that? Um, we're, we're all ears. But meanwhile, I'm gonna go ahead and um, end recording. So thank you everybody, everyone for being here and, uh, and be well.